Welcome to the Ashby Village Science and Ideas Group. My name is Joe Evinger. I coordinate uh, this group's events with the help of our co-host and tech expert, Hillary Naylor, whom you've just met. All of our members here have lots of different educational backgrounds, but we all share one thing in common, and that is an interest in science. We currently have over 70 members in this group and another 100 on our guest list outside of Ashby Village. We meet on the second Thursday of every month from 3 o'clock until about 4.30. We have a different guest speaker each month who speaks on a topic related to science and ideas. We rely on our science group members, all Ashby members, our invitees, presenters, and others for ideas about new speakers and ways that we can connect with them. Here's what's coming in the following months. We have in January, one of our own members here at Ashby Village, Joan Stromanis, PhD in philosophy, and she, among many other laurels, I might say. And she's going to share with us a presentation entitled A Philosopher's Take on the, Debor on the Abortion Debate. In February, David Sloan, PhD, is exec Executive Director of Process Development at Nectar Therapeutics, will give us a talk entitled From DNA to Drugstore, A Journey Through Biopharmaceutical uh, Biomanufacturing. Cool. In March, our own Roger Newman will present a talk entitled Language and History. We're always looking for new speakers, and if you know someone, please pass them along to me, ideally with a, a letter or email of introduction. We're particularly looking for someone that will talk to us about AI or and or AI chat. We all deal with that in our lives, uh, unfortunately, nowadays. So we're looking for somebody to get us, get us into someone who can speak to us. Um, I have to do a commercial now that Ashby Village is a nonprofit 501c3. I'll ask Hillary, please, to put in the chat a link to our website where you could make a donation, or please consider joining Ashby Village if you're not already a member. I want to thank uh, Sarah Evinger for help in preparation of this uh, presentation today. And now Sarah will present our presenter. Hi, everybody. Um, it is a real pleasure to introduce Irene Kuhn um, today, uh, who is returning to speak to us, lucky us. Uh, she holds PhDs in biochemistry and molecular biology from UC Davis. Her career has spanned uh, several years of academia and has involved 23 years in biotech pharma, 11 years at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And over the years, she has worked in AIDS, COVID and cancer research, assisting in the development of um, treatment of most recently of solid tumors. And so I turn it over to you, Irene, to say what I just said better. <laughs> okay. Um, let me start with a share screen. Okay. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. Um, Hillary, I have one question for you. How do I, let's see, get rid of, move these. Ah, I found it. I think I found it. Go away. Okay. <clears throat> Looks okay. good. Um, well, it, on my screen, I've got everybody's picture on the side to the right. So I'm just trying to find a way to, there, I got it. Okay. Great. So I can't see any of you, which really bugs me, frankly, <laughs> but um, I'm going to do my best to struggle through this. So um, and this may be challenging for everybody because this is a field that is evolving at an incredibly rapid rate. And I will uh, start by giving a background as I see it kind of the um, speed trial of history through the development of cancer immunotherapeutics, um, and then move through a, a kind of an overview of what those immunotherapeutics have been like to deal with in the clinical setting, which is a daunting problem. And I will end by giving you a snapshot of 
why we believe they're so daunting. So that's it. And my disclaimer, I'm not an immunologist, so this has been a struggle, but here we go. All right, and I'm not sure why my, my, okay, Hillary, I need another one, which is, it used to be that I, there we go. I just have to click on the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the definition that any agent, any agent that can stimulate and activate the cancer killing of capacity of immune cells to do their job in killing cancers and progressing towards non-cancer is an immunotherapeutic. That's my definition. And that is includes cancer vaccines, which we won't get to specifically until towards the end of the talk, but that's that. Okay, so I wanna give a little bit of background so that we're all on the same page. Why are solid tumor cancers so tough to cure? And so I won't be talking about bloodborne cancers. They're in a different ball of wax. Um, and all right, so the first thing is, I think everybody knows that cancer cells develop, they evolve from our normal cells through mutagenesis. And so that means that as opposed to a pathogen, bacteria, virus, or whatever, which you can attack because of their differences from us, cancer cells, in order to get something that's very specific in curing the cancer and not destroying your body, that's tough. That's the first point. So specificity of a treatment is incredibly important in the clinic and to us as patients. Um, second point is we're usually not aware that a tumor is growing in us. And I have to say that autopsy results show that all of us are full of baby tumors. All of us is too broad a term, but many, many, many autopsies show that we have tumors in us and somehow our immune system is attacking them and they don't progress. So the fact that we don't have, when we, we are developing a cancer at this stage when it's benign, we don't have a fever, we don't have symptoms of telling us that we're getting sick. That's a problem because it's going stealth. And that means that it's when it impacts other organs in our bodies that we begin to say, okay, I better go to the doctor. And by that point, it has often gotten to a metastatic stage or a stage where it is difficult to treat. So that's point number two. Point number three is that cancer cells are escape artists. They are by definition mutagenized, which is another word for transformation. And therefore they can continue, no matter what you do, they can continue to mutagenize. If you have not completely cured the cancer, the probability of recurrences, it may be 20, 30 years, you may, the recurrences may happen on a timeline after you've passed away, but recurrences are probable if there are viable cancer cells in your body. So we're talking about trying to get 100% uh, efficacy, and that's tough. Number four is the tumor microenvironment. And I don't know how um, much people know about that, but um, in the next slide, I'll show you something about the histology of cancers. But it is, the tumor microenvironment has been created there to encapsulate the um, mutagenized cells. Your body is protective response. And that in itself causes problems. So the getting a drug into a tumor is difficult because it's a positive pressure environment. The tough membrane around the tumor is a tough thing to get through. Uh, mesenchymal cells, which are fibroblasts, the, 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 the cells that come in to um, cure a wound or close a wound after surgery or after you cut yourself, those are mesenchymal cells, fibroblasts. They're interwoven in the tumor and their rigidity, the biophysical rigidity of those tissues uh, promotes cancer progression. So you're, that's another obstacle. 
The last point, which is one that drove me to go work at Berkeley Labs, is that clinically relevant lab models of cancer are incredibly rare. Cancers are tissues. You'll see in the slide of histology that I show you, they're not cells in a dish. And most people who are studying cancer are studying cells in a hard plastic dish that violates the nature of the cells. They don't, they don't do well on a hard plastic and inelastic surface. And last but not least is the quote that cancer treatment people throw around a lot, which is mice lie and monkeys cheat, meaning that there are very few models before you get into the clinic that are very good at predicting what will be effective in the clinic. So there you have it. And because of all this, that's the statistic at the bottom of the page. One in 10,000 good ideas becomes a therapeutic. Okay, so here's me in a younger version with one of the postdocs in the lab. And I'm showing this in order to show you that here, these are um, tissues that we grew, complex tissues uh, <clears throat> inside of mice. The mice were all genetically identical. And <clears throat> the tumors took months to develop, which means that they went through all kinds of changes within the mouse. Um, and this is to point out that if you look at this slide and also the immunostaining, that is that we've labeled with monoclonal antibodies, each of which has, whoopsie daisy, that's not what I wanted. <clears throat> each of which has a different colored light bulb on it. So you can see that there are quite a few different kinds of cells within the tumors and areas of the tumors. And so even within this one mouse, where's my pointer? You see a very different um, way in which the tumor has grown here, right next to its buddy over here. And so the heterogeneity within a tumor is potentially huge. So um, if you have a, a tumor that's been growing for quite a while, one part of the tumor may react to your treatment and another part say, nah, nah, I'm not, not going to, I'm fine. Who cares? You can treat me all you want. I'm not going to go away. So those are some of the um, introductions to heterogeneity. In this slide, what I wanted to point out is that heterogeneity comes in two forms. One is that no two people who have the same cancer have the same tumor. Every tumor is unique. So if you have developed um, a strategy to treat cancer, and you've tested it on 10,000 people, you have 10,000 points of data about how that drug works. You want to see that it worked across the population, but none of them are 100%, right? Because every, every cancer is going to react differently. Every person is going to react differently. So that is called intertumoral heterogeneity, that is each person has a unique tumor. And then within a given tumor, and this is a slice of a, of a biopsy from somebody's uh, uh, cancer, each one of the um, areas of that tumor, just as I showed you in the last slide, is distinct, right? And within those areas, what the um, illustration is trying to show is that you can have very different populations within each area. So this is just reiterating, no two people have identical tumors and that there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity within a tumor. Okay, so <clears throat> that's my speed trial background on cancer and why it's hard to treat solid tumors. I'm not talking about blood-borne tumors. They are much easier to access. They don't have a lot of the obstacles, um, not a lot of the, they don't have some of the obstacles that solid tumors do. <clears throat> so here's my outline for the rest of the talk. 
I'm going to give you a very speedy history. I'm only going to emphasize a few people. I um, am sure that you appreciated from Rick Schwartz's talk uh, last month that it takes an enormous amount of effort to go from point A to point B in, in a research project. Um, his is a, an interesting talk in the sense that he followed one issue for a very long time, almost 50 years. And um, so getting from A to B is, is tough. There are always a lot of people working on anything that's of real interest to the country or the world in, in terms of research. And I'm only going to highlight specific people and knowing that I'm not doing justice to everybody else, that's impossible. Okay, so um, this is going to be that speedy history. I'm uh, just reminding us here that we are blind to cancer. We don't have a fever and we're asymptomatic. And that is the simplest way to say why many, many people throughout history have resisted the idea of immunotherapeutics. Because they said, if there's no fever, the immune system is not seeing whatever's going on with this disease. So it is a waste of time to try and find any immune-based therapeutic, all right? So that is the background against all of the people that I'm gonna talk about in the world of immunotherapeutics worked against. Okay, so here's, this, here's an outline of the speed trial of history. Um, so in the 13th century, oh boy, I think I'm repeating something anyway. Um, in the 13th century, there was a traveling monk uh, who had an infection in his leg and all of a sudden his cancer disappeared. Um, I'm going to go through very quickly the um, work of Dr. Coley in the in the late, uh, late 19th century. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on Dr. Lloyd Old in the interest of time, but he is an amazing character if anybody wants to look into his work afterwards. Um, Steve Rosenberg at the National Cancer Institute. I will talk a little bit about his work. I'll move on from him to Jim Allison, uh, who was a UC Berkeley professor. And I will spend a little bit of time on CAR T cells to explain what they are, their potential, and the challenges in using them. There has been, I need to point out towards the end, an explosion of research commercialization and the contingent hope and hype um, that happens. There are now thousands of checkpoint inhibitors, which is where we're gonna get to in the world of immunotherapeutics. I will point out at the end that there are no magic bullets. There's no cures yet. Um, there have been people who have been cured, but they do not, they're not uh, extensible to everybody. So there you have it. Okay, so um, immune therapeutics, things that kept people interested in the idea of researching the possibility of an immune therapeutic date way back to 1550 before Christ. Imhotep, I'm sure I'm messing up his name, an Egyptian high priest to the Pharaoh and a healer. He has in his um, medical doctrines, uh, he wrote a lot about medicine. He said, if you want to, in to cure a cancer, you should induce an infection. That's a way of stimulating the immune system. Then in the 13th century, the guy I mentioned already, uh, the traveling monk who had a bad sarcoma on his leg. He kept cutting it out with his knife. He was not willing to stop and get treated and uh, eventually um, developed a very severe infection and it melted his sarcoma. Um, he was then uh, sainthood and he is the saint of cancer patients. Okay. So 
In the 19th century, just a reminder that immunology was in its infancy. People were still very skeptical of vacuolation, which is the previous word for vaccinations. Smallpox is the fancy and um, most reported uh, case in which uh, there was some acceptance of smallpox vaccinations, which, by the way, had been done for thousands of years in China and India. And that's presumably how uh, the smallpox vaccination idea came to the United States was through a slave who had been trained in Asia. All right. Okay. So here's our first um, person who was is considered by many to be the man who brought uh, immunotherapeutics, um, the possibility of immunotherapeutics into our scientific thought processes, Dr. Bill Coley. And for several of these people um, are MDs who witnessed some kind of miracle or what would have been classified as a miracle, that is a spontaneous regression of a tumor. And what were the conditions under which that happened? So <clears throat> Dr. Coley was uh, working in from the late 19th century into um, probably not the 1950s, uh, but um, his, his work uh, inspired a number of institutions to be funded by Rockefeller, which gave a big boost to his work. He had seen a um, spontaneous regression of a sarcoma in a uh, an immigrant worker. And that guy had been into the hospital four times having the same sarcoma cut out, resected. And <clears throat> finally the wound from the surgery couldn't um, heal properly. He was, his body was getting exhausted. And at that point, this there's a was a very uh, famous um, or dreaded bacterial infection common in hospitals, and it caused a condition called St. Anthony's fire because it induced such a horrific fever in in patients. Then they often died of the infection. Um, and this uh, particular uh, worker survived after four and a half off, uh, months in the hospital. He survived and amazingly was cured of his sarcoma. That is what uh, Dr. Coley witnessed as a young MD, and it caused him to have this passion about trying to understand what could have been going on. He, um, he uh, spent a long time, he induced amazing fevers in a lot of people who were willing to be treated by him, but he also encountered an enormous amount of resistance. And by the time he died, he was discredited by the medical community in general for having put too much risk into the patient population for something that was not um, generally accepted, had not been proven to be a viable way of, of treating cancers. But what did he do? So he um, he tried a number of different bacteria besides the ones that cause uh, St. Anthony's fire, but he, he did work with that bacteria. He made uh, tinctures of bacterial broth, growing, growing bacteria, and then trying to find which element of the soup in which they were uh, living, which toxin could possibly induce that kind of fever. fever. He had hundreds, if not thousands of patients. The records are not that uh, extensive. And he had a few cures and this guy, Emil Zola, that I've, whose uh, portrait with his um, cancerous tumor that was so large inside of his throat that he could not eat, he wasn't able to swallow. And he he agreed to undergo a whole series of treatments by Dr. Coley and eventually was actually cured of his 
tumor. Um, Dr. Coley was a part of the Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, and that, again, was <clears throat> Rockefeller um, support for him. Okay, so then <clears throat> moving on from Dr. Coley, we have about 50 years of nobody being very interested at all in pursuing these kinds of observations and trying to figure out why there would be these spontaneous regressions of solid tumors. <clears throat> and we come to Dr. Steve Rosenberg. He had been a young MD when this guy, D'Angelo, um, who had had, before Rosenberg was on the ward, in 1957, he had had a stage four stomach cancer and he had, um, he had a raging post-operative infection and there was nothing the staff felt they could do for him. They sent him home to die. And Rosenberg was blown away in 1968. He comes onto the ward. This guy comes in for a gallbladder operation and Rosenberg is like, well, this can't be the same person. He goes back through the records. He has the pathologist look at the original slides from 1957. And the pathologist says, no, absolutely. This guy had, had stage four stomach cancer. <clears throat> and there's nothing in this guy's body. Rosenberg, when he was doing the gallbladder operation, felt around. He felt no... Um, masses, uh, tumors are, are palpable because of that positive pressure that I talked about at the beginning, that biophysical rigidity that they have. So um, he's, he's like, well, okay, um, maybe this, I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I've um, <clears throat> anachronized there. So that's SR means spontaneous regression. So his question was, is this immunity? What What's going on here? Was that raging post-op infection something that that cured the guy. So <clears throat> we also have to put this in context. Very little was known in the 1960s about the immune system. I remember taking an immunology class at Berkeley and it was, it felt like garbage to me. I could not make out what was going on. Anyway, <clears throat> within that very little known, there was one uh, part that was known, which was that immunity was a transferable property. That is, you could take mice that you had um, infected in some way and that had been cured of their infection and you could take a blood transfusion to another mouse that was susceptible and, <clears throat> excuse me, and also had the same disease and that immunity would transfer to the mouse. So that's the thing to be to keep in mind is that it's a transferable property. So Rosenberg decided that he would try and cure somebody else. And he looked through all of the records of the hospital where he was working and he found a matched quote unquote, stage four stomach cancer patient who was not in very good shape and he transfused samples. D'Angelo agreed to donate blood. He transfused D'Angelo's blood, some of it, not all of it, <laughs> um, into this patient. And this is another reminder that no two tumors are the same. That transfusion was not sufficient to save the patient and the patient passed away. So, Fast forward to 1974, Rosenberg was hired as the chief of surgery at the National Cancer Institute. That's what NCI stands for. And um, although I won't be talking about other people, he wasn't alone. There were a lot of other people that were looking at this idea of immunotherapeutics, but again, it was not terribly popular because the field in general, the medical field was, was resistant and they were focused on chemotherapy and radiation. But Rosenberg had power and resources, money. And then he's he's talked about as he also had, he lived on burned coffee, a healthy ego and a single-minded focus on getting this done. And he had enough crew to um, do the work. So I've listed here, he had tumor-specific pigs, meaning that he took 
uh, T cells from um, <clears throat> people who had uh, been cured of or had had a certain kind of cancer and he expanded those T cells in pigs and pigs have a certain immune uh, similarity to us and so it's possible. And <clears throat> then he extracted the T cells and transfused those just like the mice right up there that you can transfer immunity. He transferred those T cells into patients and that did not work. He tried it many times. It didn't work. So um, by that time uh, in the 1980s, immunologists were getting a better handle on things and they um, were discovering something called cytokines. And cytokines are messenger molecules that move between cells and tell other cells what to do. Also where to go, both. So there was a, a serendipitous accident within the National Cancer Institute in a lab near Rosenberg's where they were trying to grow leukemia cells in order to study them. And they discovered that whatever they had done wrong, they didn't have a batch of leukemia cells, they had a batch of T cells. And that was the happy moment for Rosenberg, he could then look at how they had grown or tried to grow those leukemia cells and isolate what was the element that allowed the T cells to expand in number, reproduce, and grow. So that is interleukin-2, so that's abbreviated IL-2, and interleukin-2 turns out to be a stimulant for T cells and T cells will get to exactly what they are in a minute, but just briefly, B cells are the ones that make antibodies. And you're probably all aware by now after the pandemic, B cells make the antibodies that attack COVID. T cells are the ones that will kill infected, COVID infected cells. And they also have an, a terribly important role as memory cells in the body. So T cells were known to be the, the cell that could kill a cancer cell. Okay, so Rosenberg tries interleukin-2 injections, incredibly difficult experiments to do. He had to grow squadrons of cultures of T cells in order to get enough to put into people. He had to um, grow squadrons of mice in order to get enough IL-2 to put into people. So he tried both. He tried T cell therapy, he tried IL-2 therapy. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, <clears throat> there was not only a lot of resistance, but this came along. So interferon is another part of the immune system that's stimulated when a virus enters your body. You maybe remember from COVID that one of the uh, very concerning bits that we learned right after the beginning of the pandemic was that the virus that causes COVID uh, was able to turn off interferon. Interferon is one of your first defenses against a viral attack. And it turns out to have a role in cancer. And so um, there was a big um, flurry of excitement about interferon. I think it was, I can't remember, I think it was Time Magazine that called it the penicillin of cancer. And it caused a big public uh, reaction and interest in it, et cetera, et cetera. And then it failed in the clinic and so the public also became turned off to this idea of an immune-based um, therapeutic. So the AMA continued development of chemotherapy and radiation, which I don't oppose. It's just that it's not the only way to go. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I'm continuing with Rosenberg at the NCI and 
<clears throat> something that um, is incredibly important to us these days is genetic engineering, and it was in its infancy um, in the late 1970s, 1980s. The possibility of making recombinant proteins changed the ability of researchers to do an enormous amount of medical research. So you could grow a flask of bacteria. We're talking something like this, right? <clears throat> bacteria that were producing because they had been, uh, where'd my pointer go? There we go. They had been given the gene for IL-2, had been genetically engineered into the genome of the bacteria. And those bacteria in that little flask could make as much or more IL-2 that Rosenberg could work with than 900 million mice could, which is the kind of thing just gives you an idea how big a quantum jump this made. Okay, so he was able then to expand his testing with IL-2 and also use that recombinant IL-2 in the growth of billions of T cells. This gave him a big bump in possibilities in the clinic. So <clears throat> he introduced IL-2 or T cells, squadrons of them. And sadly, those tests were unsuccessful. And then the big moment came for him in 1984 when he tried both at the same time, IL-2 and T cells. And a woman named Miss Taylor was cured of an incurable melanoma. And that was a big uh, breakthrough. But as I said here, it was unreliable. So again, there was the hope given that this woman had been completely cured of a very advanced melanoma, that <clears throat> possibility led to a lot of public interest and then the, the news that it's unreliable and people get upset. All right, so <clears throat> I wanna go back a little bit and talk about immunoediting. And this is a concept that's very important to how we think about cancer and how we think about the possibilities of immunotherapy. So <clears throat> what had been shown uh, by a team, uh, Lloyd Old and Robert Schreiber a long time ago, was that um, mice, in, this is obviously not an experiment you do in people, mice can develop T cells, killer T cells that recognize cancer cells, that attack cancer cells and that kill tumors. And that you can take the T cells from a cured mouse and you can cure other mice that are implanted with the same tumor. So that shows that at least in mice, the immune system is capable of being immunotherapeutic, but not that we're terribly interested in mice, but it's helpful to know this. Okay, but then we look at people and we observe that immunocompromised people on proportion on a population scale have an increased probability of developing cancer. What's that about? And um, boy, I don't remember if I, oh yeah, okay. Sorry, that was, that was me going, did I remember to put this in here? Um, and then the third point that I have on the slide is that organ transplant recipients, sometimes, rarely, but sometimes they do develop growth of tumors or a cancer while they're immunocompromised so that they don't reject the transplanted organ. And then when you restore their <clears throat> robust immune system, the immune system, they are cured of whatever cancer came in on the kidney or the liver or the organ that was put into them. So um, that indicates that something is going on that is editing out weaker or under weakening circumstances um, the cancer. 
And that is has been dubbed immunoediting. So that's where the model that cells that are constantly in our body mutating are being edited out by the immune system. It is those cells that escape for whatever reason that have evolved to the point where they can resist the immune system. So you have weak, what we would think of as weak cancer cells that are destructible by the immune system. And it is only those that develop new tricks or uh, express new quant new gene products that, that are, and those are obviously done by evolution. That is, they are randomly expressed, but they are not killed because they have randomly expressed something that gives them immune resistance or escape. And <clears throat> so other support for this idea of immune editing, it also comes from, as I, I mentioned, um, about uh, organ transplantation. And there is um, the phenomenon is called graft versus host disease. That is that if before people really understood enough about the immune system, if you transplanted an organ into what was not a complete, a, a sufficiently immune matched recipient, then the recipient's immune system will destroy that organ. So it shows the power of the Im immune system to destroy something that could be as large as an organ. And the question was, how do you, how do you harness that power for um, cancer immunotherapeutics? And the next try was tumor specific T cells. So um, Rosenberg continuing with him at the NCI, he had a pretty good strong career <clears throat> you take tumor-derived T cells, those T cells that have made it through all of the barriers into a solid tumor, you isolate them, you expand them in culture, and you inject them into the um, uh, patient. And that was hoping that those T cells derived from a tumor, having gotten in there, would be the ones that could actually attack the tumor. And sometimes there was progress with that. So how do you improve on that idea? <clears throat> the next thing that came along was to genetically engineer a patient's T cells to recognize tumor-specific antigens, which are also known as neoantigens. So <clears throat> those those kinds of therapeutics have been working better within the bloodborne cancer field. So B cells, your antibody uh, producing cells uh, have a marker on their surface. CD stands for cellular differentiation. So it differentiates B cells from other cells, number 19. That is on the surface of B cells. So if you have a lymphoma, a B cell a cancer, and you can attack specifically the CD19 by um, making T cells that see that CD19 as a foreign antigen, you can get an, a vast improvement in the lymphomas. But the problem is that CD19 is on all your B cells and therefore you've got a big side effect problem, right? Because normal cells will also be attacked. So balance, that's a very difficult problem for hematopoietic oncologists is how are you going to balance that so that you can get rid of the proliferation of mutagenized CD19 B cells and not disturb the normal CD9 B cells that you need for antibody production. <clears throat> so one of the advances within that field is the development of chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Those are T cells that have been genetically modified, <clears throat> hence the word chimeric, and they are given a, an, a T cell specific antigen uh, receptor. 
And those are CAR-T. So that's the acronym that they're given, CAR-T cells. And they have proved extremely useful in a lot of um, cases in bloodborne cancers. I may get to the end where they are difficult to work with in solid tumors, but um, they are a very potent potential tool. And I wanna point out in support of the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute is that many, many of the advances that were necessary in order to develop CAR T cell treatments were the product of the NCI where Rosenberg was the head of uh, surgery. And it's probably partly at least because of his single-minded focus on developing immunotherapeutics that CAR T cells were finally uh, developed and they're, they are um, <clears throat> widely used in bloodborne cancers and they're sometimes successful. People have been cured using them. This is just to remind me to say again that uh, Schreiber and Old, two of the giants of immunoediting that I'm not gonna talk about more than just to say that they've done an enormous amount for the field and that they are <clears throat> were the first to publish to um, show that the model that um, cancer cells develop all the time, they are edited when they are weak, and then they become, through evolution, uh, uh, therapeutically resistant. So <clears throat> that's enough on that. So, so what about this? All this effort, and there's no cures. So the field is saying, why? You know, people are just scratching their heads. What's what's missing? We we know these parts about the potential of killer T cells to. To attack cancer cells, what are we missing beyond what's known about positive pressure, et cetera, in solid tumors? So, so far we know that T cells can see the target cells. They can see the, the antigens that are specific to the cancer that are on the surface of the cancer cells. They're able to kill those cancer cells if they can get to them. And if we pull out the T cells, we can grow billions of T cells. We can swamp a patient with a tsunami of T cells and get them into patients. And yet we don't have any reliable cures. So what are we missing? So back to Berkeley <laughs> and I misspelled breakthrough on purpose. Okay, so we have Jim Allison who's quite a character. And in the one of the last slides, I give you some resources to look at. And there's just a wonderful book in that list um, that will give you a great idea of this character. But let me just say that he uh, he's a guy from Texas and he's, he's still very active in the field of cancer research. When he was quite young, uh, long before UC Berkeley, he had a PhD project. He was um, uh, training to be a protein biochemist, and <clears throat> he was working on an enzyme treatment that basically, if you put it into the blood of mice, it would starve the leukemia cells that you had put into those same uh, mice and you could show that you could actually cure the mice of leukemia by starving the leukemia cells. He was kind of bored with that a little bit, I think. Anyway, he was <clears throat> looking for interesting things and he was going to the library and reading a ton about what was going on in immunology. <clears throat> and at that time, <clears throat> excuse me, in the late 60s, um, the world of antigen presenting cells was a hot topic. So we had finally developed enough um, labeling technology and microscopic techniques to uh, define and characterize macrophages and dendrites, dendritic cells. They are the bulwark of antigen presentation 
which means that as APCs, as they are called, they, they are cleaning up our bodies all the time, eating dead cells and pathogens. And if they're, if they detect that the, um, what they've eaten is a foreign body, then they will present to the uh, T cells, to the immune system and the lymph nodes, they will present bits of those invaders and train, activate the immune system to mount a defense. They kind of, they're the bell ringers that say, you got to go do something about this. So that sounded to Allison like a vaccine. Those presentation of dead cells, pathogens, sounds like a vaccine. So maybe he says, my cured mice, because they have been, he's been able to, with his enzyme uh, treatment way up here, where's my, where's my pointer? There it is. Way up here where he was uh, curing the mice with his enzyme treatment, maybe his mice have been effectively vaccinated against the leukemia that he had given them in order to test. So he took those mice that were just as he says, sitting around cured and eating up his mouse chow, he's in doing nothing more for him. So he gave them new rounds of leukemia cells and no therapy, no enzyme. And he found that in fact, no matter how many times he gave them leukemia cells, the leukemia cells never grew in the bodies of those mice. So they were basically immune. And so this, um, he wasn't supposed to be doing this. <laughs> he, he was interested enough that he went to Scripps in immunology. And <clears throat> by the time he got to Scripps in the 70s, the field had, had um, moved on to trying to find what was the T-cell antigen receptor. And the T so it, a receptor complex is like, um, uh, putting a fist into a glove or a hand into a glove. It's how cells talk to each other by cell surface combination of some, uh, a cell surface molecule on one cell. If my one arm is, is a cell and the other arm is a receptor, there's a receptor on this cell and they fit together and they are extremely um, specific. They're specific by shape of the proteins and they're specific by the electric charge on the molecules within that that create hydrophobic, hydrophilic uh, surfaces. So there you have it. If, if they could just find how it was, what was this molecule on a T cell that allowed it to recognize a target that it needed to go over and uh, either kill or, or do something else to. So the field is is hot on this on this topic. It has been looking for it for a couple of decades at least. And <clears throat> most of the labs that were searching for this um, this uh, receptor that would help enormously in understanding the immune system, they were looking by methods that would that were based on the already characterized uh, receptor that had been identified on the surface of B cells, those cells that make antibodies, which are, you know, another leukocyte, another white blood cell. So they were looking for that. Allison, being a contrarian, designed his experiments to find a molecule that was different from the B cell receptor. And the way in which he designed that experiment worked. He found something on the surface, one thing that stood out that was very different between T cells and B cells. He wrote up that article and he tried to get it published in the journals that would publish something as important as this T cell receptor. And he got no reception because he was not known. He was a junior person. He wasn't a big deal in immunology and it was such an important topic. He finally found a tiny journal that would take his article and nobody noticed that he had solved this big deal problem. And there was one 
exception, which was a lab at UCSD. And I can remember the woman's name, Pippa, but I can't remember her last name, I apologize. I think it was Markel, maybe. Anyway, um, <clears throat> that was a fancy lab at UCSD, a big deal lab. She and her husband were big deal immunologists. They'd been looking for the T cell receptor for decades. And they read this article, they repeated Allison's experiment, they showed that it worked and they were really shocked. They'd never heard of Allison. So anyway, the next thing they did was write to Allison, very generous move and said, come to a Gordon conference. So if you've ever been in biological sciences, Gordon conferences are a big deal. They are compared to the Davos conferences for finance, closed doors, full of hotshots, small audience. And <clears throat> that conference where Allison presented his work blew him into the limelight. Stanford offered him a prof visiting professorship. And obviously his discovery um, uh, stimulated the whole field of immunologists to clone that gene because now we wanted to be able to control it genetically so that you could direct it at different targets, right? So the competition got ugly. There were, there were uh, fights like, um, there was a guy in Tonegawa, maybe in Japan, who was working on it in another lab in the United States and they both knew that the other one was doing it and Tonegawa sent his article to, I don't know, science or nature, whatever. And the guy in the United States thought, oh shit, I'm gonna do it by overnight express. And he lands on the deck desk of the editor first. And so he got credit just as much. Anyway, okay, so, <clears throat> Allison also engaged in trying to clone that gene, but he wasn't adept at that. He, he didn't get it. But during that time, he was invited to give a talk at UC Berkeley, and he was still a really junior unknown guy. And so he was kind of blown away when two weeks later, Berkeley offers him a Howard Hughes um, position. And anybody who knows Howard Hughes knows that Howard Hughes is a big deal. And he's, um, he's fully funded to go on. And I have just noticed that I have hit the one hour mark. And so I have to ask you guys what I am going to do because I, whoops. All right. So, um, Hillary and Joe, you can probably hear me and let me know. I think, let's see. I can finish with Jim Allison in about five minutes and then maybe we should break and I should do the rest of it some other time because this is getting on too, too long and it's my fault because you guys haven't asked any questions. Are you there? No, I'm I'm here. It sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Know, are there any questions in the chat that uh, we should go through? Uh, uh, no questions yet. No. Okay. All right. So let me just finish with um, Allison, and he is the big breakthrough. So um, let's let's see if I can speed trial through him. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not going to go over a whole lot of this, but um, background that you need to know is that there are several kinds of T cells. There are cells that help an immune response and help cells to expand, and there are also T cells that kill, and obviously we're wanting to do uh, killer cells for cancer therapeutics. But all of these actions require T cell activation. And that is part of the in adaptive immune response, meaning when you are infected by something that is foreign, that's the adaptive immune response. And the question was, what causes T cell activation besides just the presence of an antigen, which they knew was not enough? 
So what's the ignition switch? So um, a lot of people uh, thought that the um, that the activation of T cells was sufficient just by target cells, but it's not. So let's see. <clears throat> so the um, so it's mu it turned out to be much more complex. I'm just going to speed through this. Um, and it, it there was a second activation molecule found, which is CD28. It's incredibly important for activating an immune response, but it again was just fine in in um, uh, culture when they tried to see if it activated the uh, the T cells. But once you put it in mice, it just stalled out, and they don't know why. So people went to GenBank, which is a huge collection of all the genetically known um, uh, sequences of DNA, and they searched for something and found um, uh, that somebody had uh, put in a genetic code for something called the cytotoxic T cell uh, activator, number four. So cytotoxic T cell activator, and it was found by similarity to the known activator of CD28. And so a bunch of groups got on it and said, okay, it's another activator. And they designed experiments to find an, a, this third activator. And the first group to publish said CTLA4 is an activator and here it is, we've found the breakthrough. And Allison, who's again, a contrarian says, you know, there's two ways to get a car to go faster. You can push on the gas pedal or you can take off the brake. And he designed his experiments to test the brake theory. And that was the big bingo moment um, that initiated the whole field of immunotherapeutics. And I won't go through this right now because this is where we could start another time um, but just to show you that um, a, a diagram of how um, immune checkpoints are work in order to activate or not activate a cell. Okay, I think we should stop there and see what's going on. Are there any yeah, questions? We're yeah. getting some questions come in now. Roger's ready to ask his question. Go, Roger. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for a, a very stimulating talk. Um, I had a couple of questions. I'm going to start with the second one. Yeah. Um, it's been very exciting this week uh, to see the uh, success um, against sickle cell disease that um, that has been developed using CRISPR to uh, edit out mm -hmm. the, the bad gene, or right. the bad sequence in the gene. Right. Uh, could something like that uh, be possible with uh, cancer? Um, <clears throat> un unlikely, except for a cancer that has a single identifiable uh, cause. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what you would need. So CRISPR, uh, it's funny you bring it up because I just talked with Joe, Sarah, and Hillary about giving a talk about CRISPR. It's oh. a fascinating, it's a fascinating field, and it has incredible potential for therapeutics. So it, I think it's worth looking at. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, cancer. So cancers, obviously, there's hundreds of them, and they're all different, and everyone is different, but. If you look at a cancer on a uh, the genome-wide uh, scale, you'll see that there are thousands of mutations, and which one drives which one's you know important, et cetera. And even if you could CRISPR out every single one of those, the fact that a cancer cell has a mutational propensity means it's going to change. So. Don't think so. <laughs> okay. uh, that said, CRISPR in the world of developing cancer vaccines and making new CAR T cells, fabulous in terms of, of making um, better therapeutics. 
but not in terms of treating mm. directly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Alan has a question. Well, it's sort of ahead of this lecture, but I wondered if immunotherapy is more promising for some types of cancer than others. Yeah, yeah. It's made much better headway in the blood borns. So what I could get to another time is um, where we are in trying to treat solid tumors. That's, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. So, I particularly was interested in pancreatic because I lost two friends to it. Yeah, it's that's a nasty one. And there is there is um progress there, but not not enough. Not enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh David has a question. Can't hear you. David needs to unmute. Um, <laughs> it, it's only been four years that we've been doing this kind of stuff. But, uh, it takes me a while. I'm a slow learner. So uh, I had a question kind of going back to your IL-2 section uh, yeah. that, that IL-2 is kind of like a gas, you know, set, stepping on the gas pedal for the T cells. It, it, it yeah. helps them grow. And if you give IL-2 with T cell receptor activation, mm -hmm. Shouldn't that work as well, if not better, than the checkpoint inhibitors? The answer that's that's where I'm getting to with Jim Allison is that the um, so they would do the experiments to look at CD28 and the tumor antigen uh, both activated, and yet they would stall. And the answer is that this is part of the exquisite power of the immune system, which I'm sure you know really well, has to be so intricately balanced that you have to have things that say, okay, that's enough, that's enough. Don't attack the whole body. You gotta calm down. And so the breaks, those immune checkpoint inhibitors, those are critical and they're very powerful. So one of the bigger problems in the clinic is once you've treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, how do you turn it off? Yeah. <clears throat> Roger, did you want to come back with your first question? Oh, yeah. My first question is a little more basic. Um, why do some people get cancer and others don't? And oh, I was thinking we all are genetically different from each other and we have been uh, having uh, different exposures to carcinogens, but there must be, um, well, I'm, my question is, is there any way to um, stop us from getting cancer in the first place? I guess that's that would be a, um, a vaccine or some way to identify what, what that difference is. Right, yeah. And there are <clears throat> plenty of people who are working on cancer vaccines with that hope, um, <clears throat> sort of training the immune system to eradicate it before it grows. That, you, know, that, you know, that is a question of probability that is difficult to measure because how do you know who's gonna go there in the first place? So, Except for familial, can't even say those words, familially inherited cancer propensities, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's a hard one, a hard one to figure out. How do you how do you do the proof that you found what's efficacious? Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to your first uh, question about some people get cancer, some people don't. It's um, something that especially with the power of genetic screening and um, what do you call that? Massaging of the data, searching of data, looking for similarities and differences and all that kind of stuff. I haven't seen a study where somebody has said, you know, I can tell who's going to get cancer. Mm. Just Tough nut to crack. What's that? Tough, tough nut to crack. Nut to crack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, 
I mean, so at some point in evolution, after if we survive climate change, maybe, maybe somebody will figure it out. Mm -hmm. But given, you know, that it's random, it's evolution, it's random mutation. And then, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. I come from a family that is cancer prone. I'm just hoping that odds are in my favor. Uh -huh. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> to all of us. <laughs> Irene, how much um, more of your presentation do you have to give if you were to decide to do it today? Are we, are oh my God! Five, you know, hours, ten, uh, an hour. <laughs> um, at least half an hour. And what I could probably do is just try and speed through it. If you want me to do that, can I hear from the group? Uh, you know, it's it's four fifteen now. We've gone to five o'clock before, but then again, is what's a sense of the group? <clears throat> I mean, basically what I have to talk about next is, um, I mean, actually I, I could, I could probably cut way through to where we are now. Mm -hmm. So that's probably, oh, we're getting thumbs up on that. Okay, so let's do that. Um, okay, Hillary, how do I get back? <laughs> <laughs> Do I hit my uh, PowerPoint again? I hit the share again. <clears throat> Just hit share again. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. And go back to here. And I am going to uh, skip. Oh, there we are. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to skip through unless somebody yells at me and says different. Uh, anything like this, where it's just showing you mechanisms, I want to get through to, okay, so you guys may know that the FDA has approved immunotherapeutics. This one is based on Allison's discovery of the first immune checkpoint inhibitor, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, this this whole field has been going crazy. And metastatic melanoma is one of the cancers where this was first applied and it's very good. And so I'm showing you here, chemotherapy, here's our survival curves, right? In terms of who who is um, doing well. And the this is called a checkpoint uh, blockade. CPB is another word for a checkpoint blockade uh, immune uh, cancer therapeutics. So you can see that you get a bump up if you have um, chemotherapy with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. This is IL-2 alone. And this over here is a combinations of various immune checkpoint inhibitors to um, show that you, with metastatic melanoma, you're getting a 50% survival rate, which was unheard of previously. Okay, so the field exploded. Um, PD and PDL one are the uh, kinds of terms that you're gonna see. I'm gonna skip over this. This shows you how it does it. And then we have to get through the fact that there are very significant problems with uh, treating with immune checkpoint inhibitors. As I said, if you take off the brakes from the immune system, it could go wild. So what are called IRAESs, immune-related adverse events. This is just a graph. You can go back to it later <laughs> if you're really interested. It shows you that there are enormous um, problems to be overcome. And that also a lot of effort to figure out how to overcome them through in the preclinical set in preclinical setting that's in in laboratory animals trying to figure it out prevention diagnosis and treatment all of them treating them is very difficult okay <clears throat> one of the ways to avoid possibly some of the immune related adverse events is to come in with combinations of immunotherapeutics so that none of them become so dominant 
that you can't steer it off. So <clears throat> the various combinations include bispecific antibodies, which I call Velcro. There are ways in which you can attach a T cell to cancer cells in a very specific way. Um, <clears throat> Com combining diff this uh, CTLA-4 works at a different point. PD-1 and PDL one work at the point that T cells are in contact with a cancer cell. CTLA-4 uh, works at the point where you are uh, releasing the squadron of T cells to go fight the cancer. There's also a lot of interest in combining those checkpoint inhibitors Chemotherapy obviously is killing some cancer cells, radiation the same, vaccines, cancer vaccines the same, uh, T cell uh, agonist cytokines to pump up the T cells. All of these will release the guts of tumor cells, which makes them visible, more visible to the immune system. So those are all in, in trials. Um, also, <clears throat> interestingly, going back to Coley's idea, the first guy that was using uh, various bacteria to infect people, um, bacteria such as listeria, which causes food poisoning, is being used. This one is the um, agent of tuberculosis, and it's effective against bladder cancers. And then my favorite is oncolytic viruses, since I've made a couple of them and they are in the clinic right now, so I'm obviously attached to them. Anyway, all of these are ways to stimulate cold tumors, meaning that's the word for a tumor that is not responding to the therapeutic, um, ways to stimulate responses so that those cold tumors become more visible to the immune system. I'm not gonna talk much more about uh, CAR T cells, but uh, people are working on uh, ways to make CAR T cells more effective and less expensive because CAR T cells right now have to be made to individual cancers and that's way too expensive for a common therapeutic. So um, I'm gonna skip this. You could go to it if you're really interested in CAR T cells. This is just to, I want you to remember every single vaccine on this list. No, mm. uh, this is just a chart to uh, point out that lots of cancer vaccines are in the works trying to find, um, th th these could be used off the shelf because these are mRNAs that have been identified as being in specific kinds of cancers. So hopefully you could, um, explode uh, cancer cells using the uh, vaccines against these specific uh, markers in cancers. And those would also be immune stimulants where you could then use an immune checkpoint inhibitor to ramp up the response. So that's what I'm talking about here. And <clears throat> one of the reasons this field is particularly interesting is because of the development of computers and digital tech. That is that now after the Human Genome Project and all of the advancements in that field, we can now do very rapid whole genome sequencing, which means that you can do the whole genome sequencing of normals from the same person and their cancer and identify what are the top 20 unique targets for those T cells which we call neoantigens, new antigens. And then you can rapidly synthesize, this is where CRISPR could come in, um, <clears throat> vaccines that are therapeutics that are targeting those markers. So I, again, I'm pointing out the ability to rapidly change the targets as the cancer evolves so that you can imagine therapy being kind of like a rolling boil instead of a cure off the bat, which might be too difficult to handle clinically. Maybe you can think about something that is a sustained therapeutic without that uh, abrupt effect. And then <clears throat> I'm just going to spend two minutes talk, and I'm not going to talk about this, but there's a lot of interest in gut microbiota that has been shown to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
gut microbiota changes have been shown to affect how responsive you are to immune checkpoint inhibitors. We all know that gut microbiota has a lot to do with the immune system, brain development, blah, blah, blah. And all of these are helpful in <clears throat> um, stimulating or supporting response to uh, cancer chemotherapeutics. Exercise, sunlight, nutrition, and less stress. I should have used that word. Anyway, um, oncolytic viruses are a way to specifically target solid tumors. Um, <clears throat> and those viruses that have been trained or engineered to see a specific kind of cancer, they <clears throat> infect the cells, they replicate specifically in cells as much as 10,000 fold per infection. So you have a site specific within the solid tumor replication of the number of viruses, therapeutic agents that are in there. And the explosion again reveals new antigens. Uh, the first to be uh, FDA approved was um, <clears throat> again against melanoma. And I'm not sure why melanoma always comes up first, but there you have it. Anyway, um, my publications are there, whoopsie daisy. And <clears throat> I, the ones that I've successfully built were for colorectal cancer and ovarian cancer. And they've been licensed by Bristol Myers Squibb, and I've spelled it wrong. Um, and they're in <clears throat> about five uh, clinical trials right now. And this is the website from the company that uh, licensed my patent, and they are doing wonderful things to arm this uh, virus with more weapons um, to use in order to boost the immune response. You know, you know, this is just an example of another one with a good graphic about w the various things that have been uh, tweaked in the virus in order to increase its efficacy. I think I put that 2021 publication in the references. And this slide is just to show that we're not there yet. Um, here's a, the first publication on the first trial of my virus. And um, obviously there's more that's needed. It's not a cure, none of them are a cure, but this is the uh, combination of an immune checkpoint inhibitor with my virus. So um, there you have it. What we need is better biomarkers so that clinicians can work with a specific patient's immune system. What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? How do we know? So it, what are called immunoscores are being developed. The more we know, when the more we know we don't know. And I'm just going to show you this graphic. This is a, a scan of all the surface receptors between cells. Again, how they talk to each other. There are thousands of lines on these, each one organ specific in the human body. We know of about 10. So you can see there's a huge amount out there waiting to be described in how the immune system works and what it does. And this is a graph of all the ways that cytokines uh, interact with their receptors. Again, it's huge. It's a huge amount of information. That's it. So this slide will be available to you. Um, and with that, uh, and this slide just explains dendritic cells, which a lot of people don't know about, but they're incredibly important. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a publication here that I've referenced. If people want to look at um, skin and gut uh, immunity, which gut immunity especially is very important. And that's it. Holy shit. 430. <laughs> Excuse my language. Uh, that, you know, that, that's just perfect. If you would stop the share, please. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. um, I've, I've got a question. Uh, what's going to be the next big, big discovery <laughs> in this area? I know speculate in five years from now, what, what do you think? Or give us three or four likely areas. Well, it, it, it depends on whether you, you give me untold resources to make it happen, because I um, I really do believe in uh, the power of 
computerized analyses and the the effect that they can have on just exploding research. So understanding the immune system, it's it it absolutely can move ahead from the kinds of things that I showed you at the very end. As a follow-up, you just talked about how complicated and how th there are thousands of different ways of, yes. of, of communicating. That. Is AI going to help on that? This sounds like a mega metadata kind of question. I don't understand AI. <laughs> well, how about metadata? There are people that deal with these huge amounts yes. of data. Yes. Um, that's what you were just talking about on the prior yes. slide. Right. There's all these th tens of thousands. Yeah, but you have to have a training set. No matter what you want AI to do, you have to train it. Yeah. And if you don't have the knowledge to train it, I don't think it's useful yet. Yeah. Those, yeah. Susan has a question, I think, Hillary. Is that true? I do. I, I um, in this, in this um, brief pass through, uh, one of the things that caused me to wonder was um, the the way medicine is going to need to get better to make um, sorry to meet to make treatments that actually respond to who we are. I know that UCSF is now doing you know a, a study of every single patient so that they have they know what their DNA is like. Yeah. I don't think Kaiser's doing that yet. I wish they were. Kaiser won't. I don't think Kaiser will. Oh, well. I'm, a, I'm a Kaiser patient, and I don't think they will for the reason that Kaiser is not an, a research institution. Uh -huh. It is at the level of public health, but not the way UCS, I used to work at UCSF. And it's an amazing uh, Stanford and UCSF. The, the number of universities, I'd say. But anyway, um, so that I, seems to me that it would personalized have medicine is a lot of people are uh, very excited about personalized medicine based on the kinds of data that you're talking about. My problem with it is it's expensive and it is exacerbating the inequality that's already present in the public health system. So I'm I'm interested in it. And it's often the way that we make advances is by benefiting the rich, but that's not going to be for everybody. So I don't I don't know the answer there. I don't know, but do you have a sense that they're the way we're we're each composed? Yeah, uh, might have an effect on the kind of tumors that we grow. Absolutely. So that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So we have predispositions genetically. Yes. Yeah, but it's, um, so, okay, so uh, how do I want to do this? So the last 11 years I spent in breast cancer research. So one in, one in eight women gets breast cancer, but we get all kinds of different types. None of them are the same, et cetera, et cetera. Can you predict who it is? Yes, you can for certain kinds with the BRCA genes that Mary King discovered, et cetera. But those are um, exceptions where you can say genetically somebody is going to be there. I don't know what UCSF's and other people's uh, data banks are going to be able to say because you have to do longitudinal studies for decades, right? I don't know. All right. Well, it sounded An like interesting was, field. Yeah, it sounded like there were just at least a few little fields where they really have already gained some knowledge about what might be best. Um, oh, that's cool. I'd love to hear from you about that. I don't. I don't know that. I haven't been following it. So that's great. Yeah, send me an email. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Hillary, I think there was one more chat here from Virginia Wolf. I'm not sure we just answered your question, Virginia, but if you would like to ask it again, or I can read it. Or she might have gone off. Oh, no, oh, no, no she's still here. here. I, oh, um, right, it, you partially answered my question um, already. That is, is there something here relevant specifically to breast cancer? Um, and where do you think that research is going? 
Oh boy. Um, I have not looked for uh, anything. I think it would have come to my attention if something were really promising. Um, after the 11 years that I spent on breast cancer, my uh, my opinion was that because of problems with models for working with breast cancer, that we were going to have trouble. And the same with ovarian cancer. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I <clears throat> I don't I don't know the answer to that. I can try and look it up and send you something, but I don't know right now. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Some something did trigger. So in the case of stage four, there has been some progress with immunotherapeutics. And, and this is something I didn't touch on, but the more complicated the cancer, the more prone it seems to be to being treatable, not cured, but treatable with immunotherapeutics, which makes sense because the more advanced a cancer is, the more immunogenic, the more neoantigens it has. So, yeah. Anyway, stage four is where we really want to be focused. All right, thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. I, uh, I do want to ask, you know, hardly a day goes by. I have to ask this very ple plebeian question because hardly a day goes by that I don't read or hear a friend of mine say, oh, they got cancer. They must have used to in their cell phone too much. Oh, wow. Yeah, I hear that so often. I know that there's no factual data, at least to my knowledge, to yeah. back that up. Any comment on that? <laughs> the, the only comment I can make is that um, there was a social media thing. This was still when I was in the lab. There was a social media thing where... Um, young women were saying that cell phones had caused them cancers and they were showing photographs of the outline of a cell phone on their skin where they had tucked it in their exercise bra. And I thought, oh my goodness, somebody really doesn't know what cancer is. <laughs> but anyway, that aside, um, <clears throat> I, you know, I can't say that there's any connection between cell phone usage and cancer, but you know, what's possible? But it's if, if it were an epidemic, we'd hear about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know it's usually said in context with brain cancer because yes. you're holding that up. And obviously there are signals, you know, out right. there. Yes, and but if you're wearing earbuds and your cell phone is down in your hip pocket, then I'm not sure, because that's a radio signal. Anyway, okay. But anyway, I I get it that it's scary, but it's I don't know that there's basis. Sarah had something. I just wanted to bring up say, along the same lines. There was a long time where we stopped using deodorant because deodorant caused breast cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And then. It doesn't, unless you use the wrong kind or something. But that was like the cell phone thing. It was kind of one of those things that went around. There were certain foods, I mean, different things at different times. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think we know so much more that we can be a little more sensible, I hope. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> you know, we... We live on we live uh, we live on what we hear from people around us, and that's the best we can do. So, we'll we'll continue being off on the wrong path about a thousand more times. Well, you know, and we also know uh, about did she just freeze again? Clusters, and we know sometimes. There. Oh, did I? You froze yeah, you for a minute. Can you uh, okay. start back? I was, my question was cancer clusters in terms yeah. of we okay. know in Marin, there was a cluster of women who got breast cancer uh, in uh, near uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, manufacturing and other kinds of plants. Uh, yes. 
we know there are cancer clusters. We know that they might attack little children or they might whatever. That seems pretty yes. real. That is yes. probably a good starting point for research, certain researchers, right? Right. And there are, you know, there there are in I've been to a number of environmentally caused cancer conferences where people are focused on finding that. In general, um, just in general, there the environmental causes are minute compared to other causes. However, mm -hmm. that's not true for other ones. And I happen to live in Richmond, and Richmond has a cluster, a cancer cluster, that is definitely environmentally caused. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, not great. But there you have it. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, any other questions before we close this out? If not, Irene, I just want to thank you for a very thorough presentation, and you've added so much animation to it, uh, and and also you, you know you bring life to a you know to a subject that's difficult for all of us to understand. And I want to thank you very much for your time. I I know you worked hard on this presentation. Uh, you, please come to future presentations. And uh, you're always welcome to come back and make a few presentation yourself on something new. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to get into a subject that I really wanted to get into. So that's what's fun for me is is uh, figuring out how to put it put together something that's that's difficult. And so it's it's great that Ashby Village that you've organized this this uh, program. I appreciate it enormously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Then thank you all for tuning in. Bye, Joe. Bye.